Power supplies are one of those electronics projects that are popular among beginners. For that same reason, linear supplies are often chosen just because of how simple they seem to be. The only problem is, though, that linear supplies can be deceptively complex, with their heating and power issues. I myself have neglected to make a power supply that was completely linear up to this point. So that's why in this video, I've put together a linear supply of my own and documented the whole process, so hopefully you can make progress to making one of your own linear supplies. So without further ado, let's dive in. Before we start designing, it's a good idea to decide what exactly we need our supply to do. Since it will be a linear design, we should really make sure to limit how much power we will use since heat is a linear supply's biggest problem. For this reason, I will aim for 12 volts with a maximum of about 1 amp. I also want there to be a constant current mode as well. I will use the famous LM317 as the core of this project. Let's start with why everyone thinks linear supplies are so simple. Here's the basic circuit used in most every guide involving the LM317. I'd recommend you watch my older videos about the functionality of these LM317s for a more involved explanation. But basically, the voltage on the adjust pin will be added to a reference voltage of 1.25 volts. The output will be the result of that addition. The resistor divider is simply there to divide the output correctly so that there is a 1.25 volt difference between the output and the adjust pin. We are already off to a good start, but already there are several issues that we need to address. Let's start with the LM317's current and heat problem. In my personal experience, the LM317 seems to have problems with sourcing any large amount of current. Even within the data seat specifications, it can still fry itself. Maybe there's another explanation, but I decided that it would just be best to bypass the issue entirely. That's when this example circuit revealed itself to me in the LM317 datasheet. Its intended purpose was to increase the maximum current through the regulator by adding a power transistor to handle the current. In case you are wondering, the smaller P and P transistor is there to form a Z-Cli pair. This pair has the same end goal as a Darlington pair, which is just to increase the current gain of the transistors. The main difference in this case though, is that the internal transistors are of opposite types. Anyways, the LM317's purpose now is just to regulate the voltage, and very little current will flow through it because of that 22 ohm resistor. So this circuit will work perfectly for my LM317 current problem. This will also simultaneously solve my heat problem involving the LM317. If you've watched my old video about heat sinks, then you'll remember this TO3 heat sink. It has incredible performance when removing heat from the IC, and it would be perfect for this project. The only problem is though, that my LM317 is in the TO220 package, so it's not exactly compatible. There are variants of the LM317 in TO3 form, but they can be pretty expensive. The 2N3055 MPN transistor, on the other hand, is not too expensive and it works perfectly well with the example circuit that I just showed you. I only made one modification to the example circuit, which was that I replaced a single 22 ohm resistor with four 100 ohm resistors. The purpose of this was to increase the power the resistors could handle. The four quarter watt resistors combined together to form one 25 ohm 1 watt resistor instead. This new single 25 ohm resistor is perfect because it allows just enough current to allow the LM317 to satisfy its minimum load requirement, while still limiting it enough to pass it through the transistor for larger loads. Speaking of the minimum load requirement, I opted to use an LM334 for this task. Normally the resistor divider would handle this problem, but I used relatively large resistors which would have decreased the current enough to cause the problem. That's why I used the LM334 current source IC. It guarantees us enough current to always get at least 10 milliamps flowing. It is also more efficient than just using a resistor since it actually reacts to the changes in the output voltage. At this point, I stopped breadboarding and decided to just finish the schematic and make a PCB. So here are the results from my designing and engineering. Let's talk about the initial power source. I decided that I should use mains power. So we'll be starting off with 120 volts AC. Linear designs always use a power transformer to step the AC voltage down. In my case, I have a transformer that takes 115 volts AC and then turns it into 12 volts AC. From there, I pass it into a full boost rectifier with a smoothing capacitor. Let's now talk about how I managed to get the circuit adjustable all the way down to zero volts. I used a negative charge pump for this purpose. Watch my recent video about charge pumps if you want to learn more. The charge pump is perfect for this purpose because we already have an AC voltage source. The required current is also very low, but we still need a stable negative 1.25 volts to get exactly zero volts on the output. 
Luckily, there is a very specific IC for that. Meet the LM317's cousin, the LM337. It is almost identical, except that it operates in the negative supply region. So, I simply connected its adjust pin down to ground, and presto, we've got a stable negative 1.25 volts. And I can adjust all the way down to 0 volts on the output of the LM317. With our 0 volts, we can now implement a proper current limiting circuit. To do this, I used a current sense resistor with a value of 100 milliohms. From there, each end is connected to a differential amplifier, which multiplies the voltage drop across the resistor by 10. So, if one amp is flowing through the resistor, the voltage drop across it would be 0.1 volts. The amplifier would then output 1 volt. So, there is a 1 to 1 correlation between the measured voltage and the current flowing through the resistor. Then, the measured voltage is sent to another op-amp's non-inverting input. The inverting input of that same op-amp is then connected to the user's desired current setting. The current setting is achieved by selecting a voltage from 0 to 1.25 volts. This works by creating a stable 1.25 volts from an LM385, which acts as a Zener diode. I also place another LM334 to get a stable current flowing through the Zener to keep the voltage stable. A potentiometer is then placed in parallel to act as an adjustable voltage divider. Back to the op amp. The output is then connected to an NPN transistor, which will pull the LM317's adjust pin down when the current limit is exceeded. This whole thing is kept stable since the new output current acts as the feedback back into the current sense resistor. So that just about does it for features. But I added a few things for safety and circuit protection. I added those protection diodes that the datasheet recommends. I also added a fuse in the primary of the transformer in case of a serious short or failure in the circuit. I finally added the slow turn on feature as shown in the example in the LM317 datasheet. Anyways, now that the schematic and PCB are complete, let's get to testing. For the final project, I decided to use these cool looking analog meters for both the voltage and current. I did get a voltage meter that has too broad a reading unfortunately, but it will still work just fine. On my first test, I already ran into my first problem, which was that the voltage would be stuck at 0 volts. I quickly discovered that it was the current limiting that was causing this issue. The reason why it was blocking operation was that it did not have any negative rail capacity. So, the op amp would drive the output as low as it could, which was 0 volts. The 0 volts though was still enough to activate the NPN transistor as compared to the negative 1.25 volts at the bottom of it. So, I did a quick fix and changed the op amp's power supply to reach down to our negative 1.25 volt reference. After this point, everything seemed to be working until it didn't work anymore. At first, I thought it was a negative charge pump in the LM337, so I replaced and upgraded those components. But the problem persisted. Then I remembered that the LM337 also has a minimum load requirement. So I added a 330 ohm resistor to solve that problem. And the negative 1.25 volts returned. But there is still something wrong with the regulator as a whole. I finally figured that I somehow fried the LM317 during the previous testing process. So I replaced it and added a 100 nanofarad capacitor in very close proximity. This capacitor should stop any fatal oscillations on the LM317. At this point, the circuit was finally working. So, let's get to running some tests. As you can see, I can adjust the voltage by twisting the potentiometer. I also attached this electronic load to stress our supply and test its limits. Using 5 volts, I started with a simple 100 milliamps. This handled this just fine, so I went up to 500 milliamps. And it also worked fine. I finally pushed it all the way up to 1 amp, and I was satisfied that the power delivery worked well. I then decided to test the current limiting functionality. So, I moved the current limiting potentiometer and increased the current on the load until it surpassed the threshold. At this point, the voltage dropped to accommodate the new load, and the electronic load ended the test because of the voltage drop. To get a more comprehensive test, I used a power resistor, which was rated for 10 ohms at 10 watts. Since this is awfully close to a dead short, I was able to change the current limit freely. And the results of this test were successful as well. The final electrical addition that I made was these two fans. I got them from Noctua so that they would be quiet, and they did not disappoint. Anyways, all that is needed to drive them is a 12 volt power source. So I just put together another LM317 circuit quickly, and it worked like a charm. The only thing left to do was to put everything in this nice looking case, which I got from AliExpress. Anyways, the first thing that I needed to do was to mount the PCB, the transformer, and the transistor to the bottom of the case. For the PCB, I had already placed these drill holes back in the design process. So I placed it down and marked the mounting holes. I then took my drill and drilled those holes out. 
I drilled them out for the size of these M2.5 standoffs so that the bottom doesn't touch the case. As for the heatsink in the transformer, I again marked the holes and drilled those out. This time I aimed for an M4 size bolt and nut. Make sure to really tighten these down since they are heavy and they will slip if you don't tighten them enough. Another thing that I would like to mention, since we are drilling into the case, we will expose the metal inside. This means that all of the screws will be electrically connected. So just make sure that you don't accidentally create any shorts. With the internal sorted out, let's work on the front and back panels. Starting with the back panel, I decided to place the plug, the power switch, and the fan driver. The power inlet was the hardest piece on this panel because of its irregular shape in the middle. So what I did was drill the two outside screws like normal. Then I used this large drill bit to create a hole right in the middle of where the inlet would be. Then I used this handy nibbling tool to cut out the rest of the hole that I needed. Then I simply drilled out the other holes for the switch and the fan driver, and the back panel is complete. For the front panel, I followed a very similar process. I drilled out the mounting holes, and then a large hole in the middle for the volt and ammeter. Then I used a nibbling tool to finish the job. After that, I made holes for the banana jacks and the potentiometers to fit. Use extra caution to ensure that the two banana jacks do not touch the exposed metal, since that will short your output together. I then soldered the remaining connections to the panels and then put them back on the case. All that was left to do at this point was to attach the fans. So I marked the top panel where the fans would go, and I drilled those holes out. These Noctua fans come with this weird mounting things, so I put them in the hole instead of screws. Just make sure to use some scissors to remove the excess afterwards. And well, that is the new power supply complete, so make sure to look out for it in my future videos. Well, there you have it, a linear lab bench power supply. Now this project isn't the most beginner friendly, so I've attached both the schematic and the gerber files in the description below in case you want to follow along. Anyways, if you've enjoyed this video and learned something new, I'd really like to encourage you to check out my Buy Me A Coffee page. These videos take a considerable amount of time and effort to make, and with your support I can keep making more of them. Anyways, thanks for watching, have a good one!